Hello everyone and welcome back to the Second Party Podcast. On a recent drive, my wife and I began talking about the podcast and some experience that we had recently had interacting with people on Twitter. And this got us both reflecting on kind of how to engage in complex discussions as a society. You know, I think recently you in particular had some relatively productive interactions with people um, on Twitter. I think it was kind of Protestants and uh, Catholics, and you guys were talking about faith and works, right? Yeah, it was um, part of the the great Protestant Catholic Twitter war of, of 2022, <laughs> at least in some of the circles I found myself in. I don't know how it started, but a couple months ago, there was a lot of discussion back and forth about Catholicism and, and Protestantism. And so I kind of started talking to a lot of Catholics on Twitter about Catholicism. Mm-hmm. And admittedly, I I don't know a lot about Catholic theology. I, I haven't really studied it that much. So a lot of things I was kind of trying to actually learn about what they truly believe. Um, well, like differentiating factors specifically. Yeah, I mean, I... I grew up Protestant, but like I would go to Catholic churches when we would visit my great grandma or things like that. Yeah. So I know a little bit. I know the basics about Catholicism, the main differences, right? Like they go to confessional and like you can't take communion if um, if you're not Catholic specifically. And, yeah, and they, if you haven't they, been to confession. And yeah. And they, the they like, yeah. you know really emphasize Mary and the saints and Mm -hmm. they all, anytime you see a a cross, it has Jesus on it. So it's a crucifix actually, but Mm -hmm. you know, Protestantism, they generally just have crosses without Jesus. So I, I was talking to a lot of them and, and just kind of trying to learn a little bit more about what they actually believe. Mm -hmm. Um, because I find it helpful for me to like challenge my own beliefs. Right. And, So I found that really interesting and a big topic that comes up all the time between Protestantism and Catholicism, I feel like, is faith and works, faith alone, right? Protestants follow the the saved, what is it, the five solas, right, of the Protestant Reformation. So saved by grace alone, through faith alone. In Christ alone. Oh shoot! I should I should have this up and I should know it, but yeah, it, it, like in Christ alone is that what it is? For the glory of God alone, according to Scripture alone. I think those are the five ones. So it's sola scriptura, sola fide, sola so gratia. That's that's grace alone. Sola fide is faith alone. Sola scripture is scripture according to Scripture alone. Sola Christo. Through Christ alone. Through Christ alone. Okay, yeah. So we were right. It's it's And then the the last one For the glory Soli Deo Gloria. Soli Deo Gloria. Yeah. Yeah. For the glory of God alone. Yeah, so it's it's salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to scripture alone, for the glory of God alone. Yeah. So that's like the rallying cry of the Protestant Reformation, right? So a big one that obviously the Catholics and and Protestants disagree on is by faith alone, right? And Catholics yeah. will say, well, well, that doesn't really make sense because the only time you see the phrase faith alone in the Bible is in James, when James says that you know faith without works is dead, mm-hmm. and you see that Abraham was not justified; he was justified in what he did. His works completed his faith. All these things that it talks about in James, and so I was having conversations with. Catholics about this. And long story short, I think we basically got to a place where we actually agreed more than we initially thought. Yeah, I mean, I think the conclusion that you kind of came to was, it's the same thing, you're describing it in different ways. Yeah, I mean, there might be more nuance to it. But I do think it is not necessarily the exact same we believe. But it's, it's closer than we initially think. Like, from an actionable standpoint, I don't think that there is much difference. Yeah, so the the big difference, I think, is is basically how you choose to market it a little bit. So the Protestants sure. say, oh, salvation by faith alone. And what they mean when they say that, our faith in Christ is all that it takes to save us. 
obviously Christ, his sacrifice on the cross. But the way that you accept and receive that salvation is through your faith. It's not through mm-hmm. things you do. Yeah. So you can you can go do all these things, right? You can, um, th- the Catholics would say, you can go do all the sacraments, go to confessional, like take the Eucharist, do all these things. And th- those are important things to do. But the Protestants kind of focus on this, like these good works you produce, good things you're doing in your life, you should be doing those. But those don't save you because we cannot save ourselves. Our, our faith in Christ is what saves us. And so yeah. that's what Protestants mean when they say faith alone. And what Catholics, I think, hear a lot of the times is, well, you can't just confess that you believe in Christ and just say it and congrats, mm-hmm. you're saved. Right. Because what about people who confess that, but they don't really mean it? And the Protestant answer to that is, well, that's not true faith, right? So then it begs the question of what is true faith? And the Protestants would look at James and they would say, true faith produces, necessarily produces good works. You're known by the works that you produce, right? A tree is known by its fruit. So if you see an apple tree and it's not producing apples or it's producing figs, it's producing something else. You would say, well, that's not really an apple tree or something's wrong with this apple tree. Yeah. And so Catholics kind of take that approach and they say they they strongly react to the phrase itself of faith alone because they worry about having a faith that's not actually genuine. And that's a legitimate Mm -hmm. concern. Yeah. Yeah. But on the flip side, right, Protestants here will salvation not by faith alone and they worry about legalism. Because that's mm-hmm. also a valid concern. And so I was having these conversations with Catholics and a lot of them I got to, I, we got to a point where it was like, I think this is maybe a semantics issue. Yeah. Like if we dig down deep enough, we, we have common ground and we agree on when we can explain what we actually are talking about. We agree on the meaning of what we're saying, mm-hmm. but we're marketing it and saying it differently. And most of that is probably just based on your background, what you're familiar with. Yeah. And I I think this is like a good example of kind of building bridges. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot of like, I'm I'm not going to say that I'm the best at this because I'm definitely not. But a lot of what I was trying to do in those conversations or a lot of conversations I do have with Catholics or people who are Christians is let's find the common ground we believe on the common ground we believe in. Yeah. Because if we can find that and if we agree on those core principles, like we can discuss and debate the other things for fun and that's fine and that can be fun and interesting, but I'm not going to have these like serious contentious discussions with you about something that's not a core issue. So if we can dig down to the like deep fundamental issues and if we agree on those, like that can help us parameterize better when we're going into conversations with people and we found that common ground. Yeah, I think the the big asterisk that I would have there is there are plenty of issues where there is a really critical fundamental difference between belief and that shouldn't be trivialized and we shouldn't ignore that and just say okay well we're trying to build bridges here right right well and that's that's the key thing right like sometimes if you're having a conversation that's higher on a surface level and you Mm -hmm. aren't sharing those core beliefs Mm -hmm. like you're not going to get anywhere with a surface level conversation if you're operating from different worldviews different Mm -hmm. paradigms that you're you're basing everything you say and everything you believe off of that if there's no alignment between those those roots Mm-hmm. You can't have any meaningful conversation about anything on the surface. Yeah. So at a high level, what I observed in some of those conversations that you are having is the high level conversation is, oh, I believe that we're saved through faith alone. And then somebody else goes, yeah, but you need works, right? Yeah. That That's kind of the high surface level but the one step deeper when you actually get at what each side is truly saying what you're actually trying to express here 
not the abbreviated version, not the abstract, you know, the executive summary. When you were actually fleshing everything out, that's where we start seeing similarities, right? Right. That's where we can find that common ground. Yeah. yeah. Because what I don't want to happen when I'm having a conversation with people, and I see this a lot when I'm just an outside perspective in on things, is I don't want to have a conversation where we're just like talking over each other and getting nowhere because we're not agreeing on terms. I say faith alone, you say not faith alone, and we're not going any deeper to analyze what do, what do we what do each of us mean when we say that and mm -hmm. try to find if if those puzzle pieces can fit together at all. Yeah. And if you don't try and do that, you're just going to like be shouting over each other and talking to each other and getting nowhere and both sides are going to become like maybe a little bit more ignorant or stubborn about their own side mm -hmm. yeah. and that's not really helpful for anyone i'm not interested in doing that and i see this all the time with people just like it's it's so like kind of mildly infuriating a little bit when i'm if i'm witnessing a twitter conversation and they're just going back and forth like arguing unproductively with each other and mm -hmm. i can look from an outside standpoint in and see this is exactly why you're arguing it's because you're not agreeing on what this word means yeah. If you talked about that and dug deeper, maybe you could find something to actually talk about that would be productive mm -hmm. rather than just becoming bitter about each other. Yeah. You know, I, I think you can probably attest to this, but one of the words that I use most frequently that almost becomes a trope is the word fundamental. Yeah. So... I know that I use this word a lot, so let's read the definition real quick to make sure that we're, we're talking about the same thing. So the definition is forming a necessary base or core, something of central importance. Okay. Right. So when, when we're talking about getting at the fundamentals of something, we're getting at that core. After you peel back all of the layers, what's at the very center? What's the most important thing here? So when we're right. talking about faith and works, what's at the core here is how you would go about acting this in your life and that which is necessary for salvation. And I think at the core there, what both sides are saying is almost indistinguishable from an actionable and from a necessity standpoint. The fundamental nature of what both sides are saying, Catholic or Protestant, I would contend is the same. Th that's my understanding based on conversations that I have had uh, yeah. on that specific issue. Yes. I'm sure there are some people on both sides who maybe sure wouldn't end up willingly aligning to that common core belief. Sure. Um, but yes, I do. I do think that it's, that's probably there. Yeah. So by contrast, I've had some instances where, I've been discussing something with someone who's supposedly a like-minded individual. And you can kind of think about it like, let's say there's somebody who identifies with the same political party as you, let's say. Yeah. And oftentimes I think we sit here and, and the opposite of the Catholic Protestant thing, on the surface it seems like, oh, we're like-minded, you would agree with me on X, Y, and Z. But I feel like with a lot of people who maybe I appear to agree with ideologically or politically, you start peeling back the layers. And when you get at what this person fundamentally believes, it's so unbelievably wildly different. Even if it appears on the surface, like you're, you're aligned in your values. Yeah. So here... Here's two examples. We'll do it for each of the two major political parties in the U.S. So on the more left-leaning Democratic side of things, you've got the, I'll say, classical liberal group of people who sit here and say, well, I'm really for bringing as many opportunities to people as possible. One of the ways that we would go about that is providing health care for people so that people can live up to their greatest potential and not have to have the burden of high health care costs 
for something that oftentimes is outside of their control, right? So that's what I would characterize as the classical liberal who's more left-leaning, right? Then you've got somebody else who's also more left-leaning, who also may vote for the same candidate, but this person, instead of wanting a bunch of equal opportunity for people, wants equal outcome for everyone. Right. And they want quotas for everything so that every possible measurable thing across society, every type of position has an exactly equal or proportional amount of every single type of person that there is out there. Every demo demographic needs to be performing equally. Yeah. When when you look at the chart at the end of the day, basically, yeah. with the metric outputs. Yeah. And if, if that means that we have to disadvantage or put down a specific group of people to do that, then so be it. Right. That actually, at its core, is the exact opposite. One group says, look, we are striving for everyone to have as many opportunities as possible. And another group is saying, no, we are willing to intentionally destroy opportunities for people to achieve our desired outcome. Right. These are the complete opposite, and yet they're voting for the same type of person. Now, in all fairness, we'll do the other side, too. So... I see a lot of folks on the more Republican voting side, so the more right-wing side of American politics. And so one group or one subset of people who would vote that way could be somebody who advocates for as high a degree of freedom as possible for people, someone who's more libertarian, okay? They would advocate for lower taxes because they don't want the government taking more money than is necessary from them. And they may advocate for the removal of religion from school curriculum. Then on the other side, I would say is the more traditionalist or um, imposing right wing side of conservatism that says, yeah, I also want lower taxes, I want the government less involved in my life, but I want a bunch of religion to be taught in schools because these are the values that we should be advocating for in general. One side here says, I want as minimal government involvement so that I can have as much freedom as possible. And the other side says, I wish to take you wish for government to be advocating for certain values. Yeah, I wish for I wish for values to be advocated for and instated that I believe are good or that are good. And both of these, again, we have the absolute antithesis in one of these very fundamental beliefs, I think. And yet at the end of the day, they're voting for the same people. Like both categories here Actually, I think I think in all four of these subcategories, the question you could ask is, what is the job of government? So if you ask what is the job of government, the classical liberal type and the libertarian type would answer something along the lines of, well, to protect people and to stay out of people's lives as much as possible, at least on the federal government level. And then the, let's say, more leftist type and the more traditional advocating, uh, imposing conservative type would say to advocate for the values and push the values that I think are good or that are good. Right? Yeah. I mean, these are all maybe a little bit crude categories. Like people generally, this is kind of a spectrum of beliefs. Sure. But, but yeah. But they characterize certain belief sets and... Yet one could find oneself voting with someone who has a completely opposite governmental view. Like the question of what is the job of government is answered completely opposite. And yet you are voting for the same candidate. Right. 
like a libertarian and a, a traditional conservative would probably not answer that question the same. What is the, the purpose of the government? Correct. Or and they the, might not. And the libertarian, their answer oftentimes is going to sound very similar to the classical liberal and the conservative is going to sound very similar to the leftist. Sorry, the, the traditional conservative is going to sound very similar to the leftist. I don't know that I would say that. But. Okay, the traditional conservative says to advocate for productive good values for society. Now, they disagree with the leftist on what those values are, and that's why they're not the same or voting for the same, but they're answering the question fundamentally in the same way. I, I don't know that I would say that I could say with confidence that they would answer it in the same way. I'm not the, saying the two, exact same way. I'm saying a very similar way. Yeah, and I, I'm saying I don't know I don't know that, that I could that I could say that. Like you're comparing the, the like leftist with like traditional conservatism. I don't know that those are like parallel I don't know that those are equidistant from the center. If, if I'm not you're saying looking they're at equidistant. A, a political, I'm not uh, saying that. Spectrum. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the fundamental view that they have on the government. I think both, in its simplified form, is something to the effect of the government's job is to advocate and push values that are productive and yeah and i'm what saying, they define as productive yeah that differs. yeah but I, i'm saying i'm not confident that like the traditional conservatives that's what they would say the job of government is i don't think we're talking about the same people then there are conservatives that sit here and say the government should make sure and prop up this business or that business, even though it's going down and failing, to take care of these people in this town. Because that's the right thing to do. What are you referring to? I don't know what this example is that you're referring to. Like car company bailouts? Is that what you're talking about? That's one great example. Yeah. Okay. Is that a conservative value? Uh, maybe I'm just, I'm in my mind defining traditional conservative differently than you are. Okay. The traditional conservative to me is like people who... That's not the about... best name for the category. You're right. You're right. It, it, traditional conservative isn't the name for the category, really. I, I don't know what you would characterize these people as. It's not like the far right wing. I... So are you talking about people who would say like, oh, alcohol needs to be illegal and sure yeah there like, you go yep great example yes okay perfect example because yeah, they sit here and they go this is what's good for society we're going to advocate it whatever impose that belief yeah i mean i i okay fine it's difficult to draw a line because the reality is like any like you can tell i'm pushing back a little bit here because any law you put in place like every law is has some moral value behind it right like i don't think that the the perspective that maybe like libertarians often take this is my personal issue with libertarianism in some sense that oh like you you can't legislate morality like we need to just give complete freedom like that's not really a defendable position to me because any law you put in place is a law because there's some morality behind it so i guess i would I would say that to some extent, everyone, unless you believe in a complete anarchy, you believe that the government should be enforcing certain quote unquote morals or values. Yes. I think the difference is the two people, the classical liberal and the libertarian, say that those values need to be agreed upon by most everyone and there should not be a small majority that advocates for something and then gets it passed 
Okay, I, I guess I'm not totally sure how I would define how those four different groups would answer the question of what the purpose of government is, but I, for sake of, I think, the point you're trying to make, I'll just, I'll accept the framing you've chosen and, and say, sure, maybe there is some, some group that fall into all of these four, like, if you want to say extreme corners or something. Sure. Okay. Maybe this is a more clear example. The leftist types believe that one's race or ethnicity is paramount. The severe right wing types believe that race is paramount in one's identity. You're talking about like radical right wing? Yeah, call it the the okay, actual cause... the actual alt right. Okay, and that's the... just not what you were saying before. You were saying traditional conservatives. <laughs> You're right. I'm not saying that the same people fall into these groups. Fine. Let's try this. We'll restructure it. The classical liberal looks at race and says, I don't think skin color matters. They've got a Martin Luther King Jr. type of view on race, right? Judged on the content of your character, not on the color of your skin. The libertarian type, standard conservative view is the same. The leftist types hold that one's race or ethnicity should be held as something paramount. And the alt-right types also hold that someone's race should be held as paramount. And yet... In many cases, the alt-right types and the conservative types will be voting for the same type of candidate, and the leftist types and the classical liberal types will be voting for the same candidate, despite having that fundamental view be radically different. Right, right. So in in this case, we've got a fundamental view that's totally different, and yet it appears on the surface like we're in agreement. So it's kind of the flip side of what we were talking about right, earlier. Right. Well, and then even in that, you have people on both sides of the political spectrum that maybe on the surface seem like they are complete, completely opposite. Mm-hmm. But if you do dig down to that fundamental, they might be pretty similar. It's like, what's, what's the, the phrase that like the political spectrum is like a circle? Right, you go so far yeah. to either end, they're going to touch and they're the same now. Yeah. And I, I guess I think a lot of times what I want to try and do in conversations, whether that be on Twitter, in person, on this podcast, is get at what that fundamental thing is. Because oftentimes when we're talking on the surface level, we don't understand the full picture and as a result, struggle to solve the real problem there. Yeah, and I think that's part of why people can get so frustrated having conversations with people when they don't recognize or dig into that deeper issue. Mm -hmm. And conversations aren't productive if you're not able to go beneath the surface. Like, on both ends, right? Because if, if, if you appear to agree with someone on the surface... And you're just having like a surface level conversation. It's like, oh, can you believe this person did this? And, you know, on Fox News or whatever, can you believe this? And it's like, yeah, we agree on everything. But like, Mm -hmm. is that a productive conversation? I don't think so either. Maybe if you dug deeper, you would have different beliefs. But both ends of the, the political spectrum, like, you know, a classical liberal, say, and like a libertarian, if they actually got beneath the surface they probably have a lot they agree on. And that's where you can actually have meaningful conversation with people. And that's where you can actually build bridges. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, a, a lot of discourse in general, whether it be political or otherwise, suffers because we don't talk about those fundamental things. Like, I think if a politician came out and didn't have a letter next to their name, right? didn't have a D next to their name or an R and somebody was able to just evaluate them for who they were and what they were saying. 
I think if they came out and said something along the lines of the libertarian, standard, conservative, classical, liberal type of view on something like, let's say, race here, where he goes, look, I agree with Martin Luther King Jr. when he said, I want people to be judged based on the content of their character, not the color of their skin. As a result, any policy or anything that's uh, directly speaking to a, a racial thing, I'm not signing. If we want to talk about things that could disproportionately affect one race or another and talk about whether or not we should remove that or alter it, I'm totally down, but I'm not going to you know, add another wrong on top of something to try and make it right. Two wrongs don't make a right here. I think that both sides of this, pushing us to talk about more fundamental things, will help the discourse, whether it's political or whether it's theological, right? And when you get down to the core of that, I'm not saying that it always ends with everyone singing Kumbaya and holding hands, or that it results in everyone getting mad at each other and running away, because we gave two examples here. But I think it will result in better understanding and more productive right. solutions. Right. And like, the, this word is so overused, but like actual tolerance of each other. Like if, if we can, in good faith, dig deeper into our conversations and talk about things like that and try to find where mm -hmm. we do have common ground on things. Mm -hmm. And even if we don't agree, at least walk out of a conversation better understanding where the other person's truly coming from. Mm -hmm. I think then we can start to actually respect other people better and have an increased civility or actually good tolerance about other people with different ideas. Yeah. You, know, you mentioned something earlier. You said, oh, it's just a semantic difference when you were talking about well, I you know, didn't Protestants. Say it was, I didn't say it was just a semantic difference, but I think that it, okay, it's it doesn't primarily. appear to be a semantic difference to me. Um, yeah. Mostly, yeah. And, and I think that's a great instance where I think people are at least primarily getting lost in the semantics of things. Would you agree? Yeah. And I'm just like so not interested in that. Personally. Yeah. Like it's so not compelling and just really frustrating to me when I when people can't get past that. Yeah. And you know, I, I know it may sound silly when we oftentimes pull up a dictionary definition of a word on this podcast. Like I think in a previous episode we brought up the definition of loyal. Like everyone knows what that means, right? But yeah, but like, do we? <laughs> you're you're eight and yeah. you're using the word all the time, like in theory, you should know what it means. But so often we're using words and we're talking and I'll notice in a conversation, somebody will, will use some word that means something so radically different and nobody even begins to address it. Like a quintessential example nowadays is uh, the substitution of the word equality with equity. Yeah. These are, these are totally different words. They're different words for a reason. Now, when I think about equality, I think, generally speaking, about equality of opportunity. And when I say equality of opportunity, what I mean is that no external force is positively applied to hinder you. So I was born a certain height. If somebody else was born shorter or taller, yeah, there's not equality in that, but some organization didn't come in and force somebody else to be shorter. Versus when we compare that to equity, to me, when I hear equity, I hear equality of outcome. And the reality is that you can have equality of opportunity. Everyone could actually be at the same starting point, but if somebody works harder, or somebody is smarter, or somebody gets a little bit lucky, there's always going to be disparities in outcome. Right. 
And the only way to correct for that is to take from some and give to others. Now, we can debate about whether or not we should or should not do that, but... That's not the same thing as equality. Though. Yeah, but it's, yeah. it's yeah. not the same thing as equality. But people exchange these right. words so often. Well, and I think that's that's also why like we find ourselves in conversations with people a lot, specifically asking, what do you mean by that? Yes. I've, like, I've like, encountered a lot of things on Twitter where I ask, what do you mean by that? And we end up in like a circular thing. Right. And I think it's important an important question to ask because, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we have language because language is how we how we communicate and share in an understanding. And we, we rely on having some baseline understanding of what words mean in order for us to even be able to communicate. But even so, when you're having conversations with people that can easily get lost in the weeds, mm -hmm. like we need to ground ourselves and make sure we have a shared understanding of what exactly we're meaning by things. Mm -hmm. Right. So when, when you come to me and you say like, Oh, we, we have to, we have to take the Bible seriously and read it literally. I go, okay, what do you mean by that? Yeah. Oh, we have to take the Bible seriously. We have to trust what it says and all the words that it says. Okay. Yes, but that can manifest in very different ways. So let's mm -hmm. talk about what that actually means. Like, let's try to get to the core of it. So I find myself saying that a lot. I probably picked this up from you, but just when people say things, what do you mean by that? Yeah. You say faith alone. What do you mean when you say faith alone? Do you mean that someone can just say the words, oh, I have faith in Christ and congrats, you're saved? No, I don't think you mean that. Yeah. And if you do... Let's talk about that then, I guess. But I don't think that's what you mean. Yeah, I've had you know a, a number of instances on Twitter where I'm talking with somebody, and I can tell you exactly what it comes down to. I had I had one interaction where it came down to the question was, and and this is what we severely disagreed on, and and we never really reached a conclusion on this one. But like, what does gratuitous suffering mean, or what does unnecessary suffering mean? We can agree on what suffering means, but when you put a modifier like gratuitous or unnecessary in front of it, that's relative to something. Unnecessary for what? Unnecessary relative to what? Gratuitous above and beyond what? Right. Or who, another who's one was judging what is a necessary amount. Yeah. yeah. Or or another one was even just the word church. What does that mean? Because some people right, mean, right. oh, it's the building down the block. Some people mean it's a body of believers. And then you ask, well, what, what does a body of believers mean? And even that can be broken down. Like, okay, it's a group of like-minded individuals that unite around a set of principles. You can ask, well, what are those principles that they necessarily need to unite around? And like, there's a point where we can understand what the other person is talking about and then actually be able to have a conversation. But too often, I think that we get too often. I think we gloss over something like that and all of a sudden we're off in the weeds. So like the church example, somebody said like, Oh, you need to be a part of the church. Like what exactly does that mean? Or you need to follow the church. Well, I don't think you're talking about a building. The building's not running away. Right. So what do you mean by the church? Oh, well, I mean the... The structure, the organization. The body of, of believers, whatever. the body of Christ. What does that mean? Right. What exactly does that mean? And and I'm not trying to be, like, annoying when I'm asking these things. Be I ask because oftentimes the answer is in a question. Once we understand what the other person means, things cascade from there very quickly. And you, you very quickly understand how you can either come together and reach a conclusion or that there's a fundamental difference that that is not going to be yeah well and it, it's a two-way street too right because if you're mm -hmm. going to have a productive conversation with someone like both parties have to be willing to peel off those outer layers and and dive deeper into what they actually believe and part of that takes courage because it can be a vulnerable thing to do yeah and part of it also does take self-reflection because 
you have to be able to ask yourself, well, well, why do I believe this thing? Like, what is the root reason for this belief that manifests on the surface? And I think maybe a lot of people don't actually know the answer to that. Yeah, I think you could, you could maybe even take that a step further. Maybe when you ask the question, they don't know what they actually believe. And that's why they right. I think, can't answer yeah. the question. I think I think that is more common than than we probably know. Probably. Well, I'm sure there are things like this for me where I, I probably have lots of beliefs where if you really probed me on it, I maybe I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly why on the on the deepest surface. I, I don't know, but I, I I think there are probably a lot of people who have that on a lot of beliefs they have. And I think that's part of why, like, you know, when we talk about going into the fundamentals and like what we're trying to do on this podcast is going deeper and talking about those fundamental things, because that's mm-hmm. where you actually that's where you're actually talking about something where the, yeah, there's actually you know I mean? meaning there. It, you're not just saying words that that have come in your ear and and you're just spitting out. Oh, like you're, you're not being you're an at, ideologue. You're actually processing something, like mm-hmm. using your mind to take in a set of of beliefs or inputs or whatever you have, processing it using some algorithm you have in your your mind and then forming an idea. Yeah. You're actually thinking about something when you have a core that you're building your beliefs off of. Mm-hmm. versus just saying whatever whatever you've heard or whatever you've seen or whatever's come to mind. And so, like, we don't want to talk about just things on the surface. We want to go deeper and we want to mm-hmm. ask those fundamental questions and talk about what's at the core. Yeah. You know, I think um, oftentimes, definitely between us and then frequently posting to Twitter, I'll tweet something that, is kind of like a hardball stance on something or I'll take like a very definitive stance on a topic that is most definitely not fundamental, at least on the surface. And one of the things that I really like about this, or one of the things I really like to do with this is take something that seems to be on the surface, a trivial matter, and use that to point to a deeper meaning. And I think what this does is two things. One, it illustrates how deeper meaning things affect everything in our day-to-day lives. And two, it gives one an ability to almost practice some of these means of thinking and expressing oneself so that when it does come to something that matters, you're equipped with the tools. So for example, I've tweeted about front license plates on cars. And I know that it may come across as like kind of a joke, like, oh, I absolutely despise front license plates. They're an atrocious abomination on society. They're a scourge on the car design world, right? And I've got this like passionate take on it. And part of it is like poking fun and having like a bit of a joke But also, I do think that it speaks to a deeper truth about, like, beauty and about design and about sometimes putting a small morsel of functionality to the side for aesthetics and beauty. Or, in my opinion, the unnecessary reaching of of the government into someone's personal lives about having some front license plate on your car. And even if somebody doesn't recognize like some of those deeper truths there, I still think it serves as something that forces people to see the world differently or to think about things differently and to think about seemingly trivial things in a more deep fashion and to recognize them. I think it serves like practice. Like when, you, when you're playing for... A sports team you'll often scrimmage against your own team right like you're, you're never going to play against your own team in the playoffs you're never going to have to beat your own team to get first place to win the super bowl to get the trophy at the end but 
it serves to make the team better. And I think that's part of the reason, too, why I like debating like these kind of quote-unquote hot take issues, whether it's front license plates or the best holiday or why ice cream is overrated or what have you. I can't believe you just said that. Ice cream is overrated. <laughs> I stand by it. I, that does not mean that it's bad. I mean it in the truest sense of overrated, that it is rated higher than it ought to be. I don't know that we can find any common ground on that one. Just have to walk away from that conversation. Well, maybe we'll have to end it there then. So I guess all jokes aside, right, the reason why we, we kind of wanted to sit down and talk about this a little bit and it's not been super structured, but sometimes sometimes you just sit and and talk about what's on your mind and that's the best way to to get it out I guess but we just wanted to I guess reiterate that's part of the the purpose of this podcast and what we're what we're hopefully trying to encourage right is thinking about fundamental issues and Mm -hmm. trying to dive dive deep into conversations and thinking critically about what do you actually mean when you say this thing how can we have more meaningful conversations with those around us try to find the common ground dig beneath the surface because that's where true connection is found and I think that's where true innovation maybe and actually advancement of ideas can be found yeah and when we get to those fundamental things we're able to build bridges with unlikely parties I think we're able to resolve and solve more problems I think we're able to not get lost in semantics and part of that is like defining words and making sure that we're on the same page so that we understand each other and one of the ways that we can kind of practice this i think is by having conversations about seemingly trivial things understanding a potential fundamental truth that they point to and using it as a chance to practice having those conversations yeah for sure and maybe if if you haven't listened to it yet go back and and um if you're interested in in hearing more about maybe what what we think are effective tools or i think we we call use the word rules for having productive conversations with people which is yourself primarily yeah yeah. which is what we always want to have like we don't want to have unproductive conversation i'm so not interested in that um but I would say if, if, if you want to hear more about what our rules are that we've kind of established and what we, we try to follow when we're having conversations and talking about things, go back and listen to that episode. I think it was the second one. Um, welcome to the second party. What are those rules for having productive conversation? Yeah, that, that's really the, the structure that we use to keep ourselves in check and to make sure that we're doing everything we can to engage in productive conversation. Well, it's getting late. But on a similar note to earlier, when we were talking about ice cream, one may wonder, what isn't overrated in the food space? What's severely underrated? Well, I would contend that muffins are the most underrated food. There are so many different options. You've got everything from cornbread muffins to banana bread muffins to strawberry rhubarb muffins to blueberry. You've got all sorts of stuff under the sun. They're relatively portable. You just have it in your hand. They're good at all times of day. And I don't hear people singing their praises. I hear people talking about cookies, about cake, about cupcakes. Muffins are cupcakes that actually have substance to them. Cupcakes are the shallow, dressed up, full of makeup version with no substance. Muffins, that's the true pastry of substance. You know, scones and muffins are really the miracle success children of the pastry family. I hesitate to even call attention to the fact that they're a part of that delinquent family. I mean, I feel like I'm almost desecrating the name of muffins and scones. 
because all almost every other pastry is just atrocious but they really are the successes that came out of that family with so many different options i can't even remember the last time i had a bad muffin muffins are the most underrated food and they should be getting way more love than they do with that thank you again for listening if you've got any positive thoughts on muffins or any other thoughts feel free to send us an email at secondpartypodcast at gmail.com we'd love to hear from you thank you again and have a good night